So the Shambhala warrior prophecy is an ancient Tibetan Buddhist prophecy that um, Joanna Macy speaks about, and I encourage everybody to listen her to her telling of it. You can look it up on YouTube. So I'm going to give a little paraphrased version, but it basically goes like this. There comes a time in human history, uh, or there will come a time in human history, this is how the prophecy goes, where the fate of humanity and the whole world hangs on by just the uh, the the frailest of threads it's, it seems like it's kind of near i feel like we're <laughs> in these times too yeah. yes okay and at this time it's going to feel very hopeless because there are going to be some very powerful people and dark forces and powers in the world that um accumulating these weapons of mass destruction and it's just getting darker and darker at this time when it feels like all hope is lost the Shambhala warrior enters into the picture. Now, this is not a warrior that you're going to recognize because of they have like a shield or a sword or a certain insignia on their military uniform. These warriors are more incognito than that. And how they will, um, how they approach this situation is by entering into the halls of power where these decisions are being made and they will dismantle these weapons of mass destruction because they know that these weapons were made with the human mind they are man-made therefore they can be unmade with the human mind there it's not some supernatural force that we're fighting against if we did it we can undo it Mm. and so these are like undercover warriors going into places where all the decisions are being made and they're influencing and they're unraveling and dismantling and and building new systems and they have two weapons the first is the weapon of compassion Mm -hmm. and the second weapon is the weapon of the understanding of the interconnectedness of all living beings so the compassion is the heart medicine and this understanding of inter interconnectivity is like the the mind like the mind um helping you balance out that compassion because if you just live in the compassion oof you can get really burnt out it's very heavy stuff that we're Mm -hmm. living through and so the other part reminds you that everything is interconnected we all have a role to play no matter how how small and just to see the bigger picture and that we're not alone and so i when i heard this i was like whoa this is so this so deeply resonates with me and how I I just feel called to show up in the world a but b I didn't understand the weapons of mass destruction part until about a a year ago I thought like oh I'm gonna go in there and like yeah the weapons of mass destruction so like nuclear arms etc it wasn't until a year ago that I um my mother told me that my um my grandmother was who's a rural farmer in Peru um, they were sold DDT uh, as a form of delicing their animals and were also told that um, they could use it on their children when their children got lice um, came home from school mm. with lice that they could rub it on their heads and two of my aunties died from cancer and I just put the dots together and that's when I realized oh those are the weapons of mass mm. destruction that I'm being called to dismantle the agrochemical industry (laughs) that those I mean we don't think about those as weapons of mass destruction but they've been unleashed upon us and so yeah that's that's why I do this work with the soil and the lobbying and the advocacy and the fungi because um at the end of the day it's all part of this like fight against this industrial um chemical complex Mm -hmm. that controls what we eat what we put on our bodies Mm -hmm. and it's personal now and we're seeing this i mean we in the toxic chemical spills that are randomly and weirdly happening all over this country and you know the byproduct of the the train derailment and this like foss gene or something whatever it was called that was it was literally like a weapon chemical weapon that they used in world in in Mm -hmm. world war ii and we also found like Agent Orange, which oh. kind of became chemo, right? Like the chemical destruction we are um, inflicting on ourselves is is the biggest weapon of mass destruction, and it's why cancer is. I mean, I can't go when I started making heal, however many years ago, six, seven, eight years ago. Like five, when was it? Um, you know, I, I literally was like I, a week. You know, every week goes by or every month goes by that someone I know I hear someone getting cancer now it's like 
the amount of health issues that I'm seeing is is just devastating, and it's just so. All of that to say, um, I have that that the 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 prophecy of the Shambhala warrior, and looking at you and the work you're doing. Literally, besides the fact that my favorite jeweler is Shambhala, I have like four different Shambhala bracelets. It's like it's, and I've been wearing them for like ten years. Um, so it's it just, and I just was drawn to this company. They make beautiful jewelry, um, but this is just like that's the hopeful, mm-hmm. you know, like the people that have been personally affected, the work you're doing about bringing these ancient, indigenous technologies and wisdom and you know they are cultures that are heart driven and they have that combination of connectivity and compassion you know and that's what we need to reintroduce into this modern society that is just literally a toxic train derailed well thankfully we have the fungi to help us heal all this toxic waste i mean this is part of why i feel so drawn to the work of the foundation because We've released all these toxins out into, we've unleashed them onto our populations, our waters. I mean, they're everywhere now. Mm-hmm. And so my only hope is that fungi be having such a voracious and wide appetite. They'll eat up plastic. Like you said, they'll eat up oil spills, even nuclear waste. You know, I think that's the future is that we have to start working with these fungi now and really putting serious money into the research behind micro remediation that's our only hope of like decomposing and moving through this like toxic era that I hope our, our future um, the, the 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 generations that come after us will look back at us and like you know like remember us with 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 uh, disgust like what a toxic <laughs> like what a toxic time in human history thank god the fungi came in after that to clean clean that all up and to teach us never to do that again um, but I would really love to just end on this piece around yes. the work of the Fungi Foundation because I really appreciate the fact that um, you put so much emphasis on this interview on like what we can do, what we can do back home. And I feel like this supporting the foundation is something that is going to leave a legacy for future generations because they are the only, um, well, when they started, they were the only NGO dedicated to uh, mushroom fungi conservation in the world. Can you you imagine the plants and the animals just having one NGO right. looking out for all the species and fungi is a massive kingdom that's even bigger than <laughs> right and we're only we only know the powers and the incredible powers and intelligence of five to ten percent exactly now imagine that there's just one NGO looking out for the preservation of biodiversity of plants or animals and imagine that their budget is under five hundred thousand dollars a year I mean, that is shameful. Mm -hmm. And I say this because I I kind of want people to know how important it is that we show up in that way. Um, I'm going to quickly touch on some of the work that they're doing doing that's amazing. So we can't even... um, there's not even enough data to show how many fungi species are going extinct because it is such an under-researched like, part mm-hmm. of, of science. So they're putting a lot of work into collecting that data. And then from that data, they can identify the specific species they're at risk. And they have successfully put one of these species on the red list. This is exciting because once you get on the UN's red list, it means you can protect that whole habitat from extractive industries, from from construction mm. from any kind of any kind of like um, destruction or deforestation and one of the biggest threats that fungi are facing is the fact that their habitats are under under threat from logging etc because their habitats are old growth forests okay so with this precedent setting move of protecting this uh, fungi putting it on the red list now we can this is just setting the domino chain you know starting that domino effect of like finding other species and being able to go around all the whole world to old growth forests all around the world and wherever we find fungi habitats and say sorry you can't come in here you can't cut down these trees because we've got an endangered fungi here and we don't want to lose that to humanity Mm -hmm. and so there's that part there's the conservation part juliana has also managed to get the rights of fungi enshrined in law in chile which is the first country in the world to recognize flora fungi flora fauna and fungi in the environmental protection laws we're hoping to that also um, starts a domino effect around the world 
Next, we're creating a fungal-based curriculum so that it's accessible to anybody for free all around the world in partnership with Louis Schwartzberg and Fantastic Fungi. But this is because we're going to need citizen scientists to be going out there and to be documenting and, and cataloging. Um, and so it's, it's not right that children in school don't learn about fungi next to plants and animals. So we're hoping to change that. And then lastly, we have the expedition piece where we go out to discover new species of fungi, which Juliana discovers every time she goes out there and that goes back to a fungarium where they have currently preserved I think over 2,000 species and this is going to be like the Noah's Ark mm. if things get really bad and we start losing these habitats and losing all these species at faster rates this fungarium could be our only hope to save these species for future generations so talk about doing the seven generation work you know there could be some some moment in the future where all of our energy needs are provided for by fungi totally. and, uh, and somebody's going to say Thank God those people donated to the Fungi Foundation right. <laughs> and became monthly donors in order to, to support this work yeah. because that fungi could have been lost forever. We were at the brink of losing it, except this amazing org came in and saved it for future generations and now we've created some new energy source out of it. And that's not far from the truth because um, Otzi, the Iceman mummy, was um, when he was, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, he's 10,000 years old, okay, so he was dethawed in Switzerland and he had he had a little medicine pouch on him, very stylish, and he had two <laughs> mushrooms in his pouch. One of them was to treat parasites and when they did his autopsy, they found he did have intestinal worms. So he was savvy. He was like, he was on a detox. Yeah. <laughs> he was collecting his medicine <laughs> to detox. And he had this other mushroom that was used for kindling. So you didn't have to like, imagine in the ancient world when you built your own fires, to not have to start again and to be able to take embers from one fire on this fungi kindling to be able to start your next, that would have been like miraculous. Mm. And so if there's a fungi that can be used for kindling and for like, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced there's got to be one that can replace fossil fuels. Totally. You know? Absolutely. So this is why the work is so important because of what we don't know. And uh, if anyone has felt spiralated by this chat, um, you can go onto every.org and sign up to give five, ten, twenty dollars a month to the org. And a big chunk of our um, of our budget comes from the mycelium revolution of just people out there who feel called to support. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.